Please note today's session is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the National Cancer Institute, I wish to welcome everyone to the first Advanced Topics in Implementation Science webinar of 2019. We are excited to be joined by our speakers today, but before we get started, a brief word about logistics. We ask that if you are not already on mute, to please keep your phone on mute for the duration of today's presentation. As mentioned, the session is being recorded and muting all lines will help us to avoid any background noise. We encourage questions. They can be submitted using the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Type your question in the provided Q&A field and hit submit. Feel free to submit your questions at any time during today's call. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and uh, let me share my welcome to everyone who is tuned in. Uh, we're very excited about uh, starting this year off right. Uh, and we uh, have continually tried to figure out what kinds of topics are those that the field is, uh, is wanting more discussion, has questions, has some thoughts about how we can advance things together. And, and certainly this topic is, uh, is one of those. Uh, for those of you who have not uh, participated in these fireside or campfire chats, depending on where we are uh, in the calendar year, um, the focus has really been on cultivating a conversation around a particular topic. We invite several experts uh, from our broader implementation science community uh, who have specifically led work around a particular topic, and then we walk through a series of questions. Ideally, as many of them as possible come from all of you. And so you'll see, as Sarah had mentioned previously, we have a Q&A feature, and as soon as a question pops up in your mind and you want to share it and you want us to take it on, uh, please do uh, type it in so that uh, we have a chance to integrate it into the discussion. Uh, this is our way, again, of trying to think about some, uh, some areas that we have developed to a certain extent um, and some areas that we really need to do more work in. And so when we were thinking about the first topic, uh, around uh, 2019, we really arrived at this challenge where we know that there are a lot of influences of health economics on the work that we do uh, in the implementation science space, but there hasn't been as much discussion and as much integration of these, of the conceptual models, of the uh, appropriate measures, appropriate outcomes and concepts that we think would really help us make sure that at the end of the day, we have tangible evidence that supports decision making on all fronts in all settings across all questions that we have related to the implementation of effective interventions, the de-implementation of those things uh, that are not so effective. And so uh, our two experts have most recently or relatively recently been featured in two of the edited volumes that have come out over the last uh, year plus uh, that have tried to give us an update of where are we in terms of implementation science in cancer, that was the one that just came out in November, or where we are in terms of the updated uh, second edition of Dissemination Implementation Research in Health. Uh, and so Heather uh, Taffet-Gold from NYU uh, authored for us a chapter in the specific book around advancing implementation science in cancer, uh, and Ramesh Raghavan has now, uh, I believe, contributed chapters to each of the two editions uh, of the book uh, edited by uh, Ross Brownson, Graham Colditz, and Enola Proctor, focusing again on what are the major issues, what are the things that we should be thinking about as we seek to integrate health economics uh, with implementation science. And so uh, we're very glad that, uh, that they are here uh, with us. You'll see in the chat function as we go on, uh, we'll try to make sure that the references, the resources that are mentioned uh, are populated so that anyone can, can follow up on them uh, if need be. And so you'll see in the chat room that we already have those two edited volumes, which I just said. So thank you, Sarah, for that. Um, and, and so what we'll start out with is, is just some sort of overarching questions to get some of the conversation going. But then again, as, as said before, uh, we'll look for that Q&A box and, and start integrating what you want to know. You'll also see, uh, after you've seen the lovely faces of our two uh, invited guests, that periodically there will be a change of picture. This again reinforces that not only uh, is, is a fire a nice place to be if you're a certain distance away, but there are opportunities to roast marshmallows and, and other such things as you please. So if you're sitting by your fires, we're clearly sitting by uh, our clip art. So uh, <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, so just to begin, uh, for, for uh, maybe Heather and then, and then Ramesh, in addition to welcoming you to both, I wonder if each of you in turn could talk a little bit about how you first became interested in implementation science more generally, uh, and then specifically how you thought about the interface between health economics uh, and implementation science. Uh, so Heather, you want to start us off? Sure. Thank you for having me today. 
Um, I became uh, interested in implementation science because of some colleagues who were conducting implementation research. Uh, Donna Shelley here at NYU has been very involved uh, since the start in implementation science and asked me to start thinking about some of her programs and her implementations and how we might start conducting some cost analyses and economic evaluations. So I really give credit to Donna and her foresight in thinking about how important um, it is that you, you may have um, effective interventions and even effective implementations of those interventions, but decision makers need to know whether the interventions are worth it and whether those methods of implementation are worth it. And so uh, that's how I got engaged, was really as a collaborator on projects. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks. Uh, Ramesh? And for me, I was trained as a health services researcher and became very interested in public finance. A lot of my work involves Medicaid policy. Um, and my first job out of graduate school was as um, the policy director for the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, where we were trying to enhance quality of care for a national grouping of child mental health focused agencies that were engaged in enhancing trauma focused services. So this at that time was the largest children's mental health collaboratory where an implementation effort was underway. So we contracted with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, began delivering um, trauma-focused CBT using the Breakthrough Series Collaborative Model to many of our 44 different member centers. It was a massive enterprise. And as I became involved in that, it, it increasingly struck me that in, out there in the practice community that we needed to pay attention to issues of economics that this was, this was something that was very, very real to folks outside of relatively well-resourced academic environments. And I think that stimulated my interest in the economics of implementation. Great. And, and I wonder if each of you, and maybe Ramesh, starting with you, uh, can, can talk a little bit and maybe reflecting on the more recent work that you've done in trying to synthesize uh, work in the field, how you've seen the activities around this overlap this interface between implementation science and, and health economics advance? Yeah, in, in several different ways. I think um, first, I think there are, some, um, there are some really innovative and interesting methodological approaches. I'm thinking here, I was just reading um, a few months back um, a paper on mixed methods approaches in economic evaluation and Danny Eisenberg is the, at, at Michigan is the senior author on that paper where I think, you know, we're traditionally used to thinking about economic evaluations from a purely quantitative perspective, but I think the need to have mixed methods approaches, especially in a field like implementation science, um, where there are so many of these moving parts and where there's lots of, you know, preference elicitation that needs to be done. I think that's a, a very good um, move forward. Um, I, also, I also really like this idea of learning from resource poor countries. So um, um, Manisha Yapa, I think, has had a paper also in implementation science uh, last year, um, which, where I think that they're trying to figure out how do resource poor countries do implementation and how can we learn from that? Because in many resource poor environments, and I work overseas as well, um, the amount of resources available to support implementation activities are non-existent. And so you're forced to do a lean, mean implementation strategy. And if that works, maybe we can actually learn something from those experiences. And I think lastly, the past three years, I think, have seen a dramatic increase in the publication of various economic evaluation protocols. And I think that's a, that's a very, very good thing because it sort of, I think, enables us to figure out how other people are applying their craft and allows us to, I think, shamelessly steal worthwhile ideas from one another. Borrow, I think the word is, rather than steal, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Heather, you want to uh, chime in how, how you've seen uh, activities advance in recent years in this space? Sure. I think Ramesh's last point is really important, that there are more protocols out there that mention costs. Um, so there seems to be a lot more awareness about the importance of incorporating a cost analysis, a budget impact analysis, um, a full economic evaluation by, by um, uh, implementation scientists in the field. There's um, uh, 
further development where people might actually conduct uh, or um, develop a model, so a simulation model, rather than only focusing on short-term outcomes. What's the longer-term impact if we can sustain these uh, interventions that we're implementing? And so the modeling approaches are, are definitely developing. Um, and finally, I would say there's more, uh, there are more educational opportunities to learn about how to collect cost data, which cost data to collect. I know I've started teaching uh, in the last few years a course here at NYU, and um, uh, I started out in uh, cost-effectiveness analysis in health and medicine more uh, in a clinically oriented way, and implementation science brings with it a whole host of other questions and, and things to consider uh, that, are, that are not the traditional cost-effectiveness analysis. So um, branching out and teaching in those areas, I think, ha has been a, a new development. David, Great, can, I, can I jump in yeah. and sort of oh, express please. enthusiasm? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, one thing that Heather said, I think, was, was so, so spot on when she spoke about modeling. Um, about six years or so, I think, uh, Hendricks Brown wrote a paper where he articulated the need for computational approaches and those sorts of strategies to um, better understand and model in a sort of an in vitro environment uh, implementation strategies and approaches. And David, I think you wrote a paper also um, where you called for system science approaches um, to, this, to, to implementation research as well. I think what we have, what we have not seen, uh, and it'll be great for us to think about this, is really creation of those sorts of implementation research simulation laboratories where we can sort of systematically parameterize a range of these implementation um, decisions and implementation actors and either using agent-based modeling or any of these computational strategies that, that Hendricks talked about or others have spoken about really move the science forward. And I think, I, I don't know if that is what Heather was alluding to, but I sort of wanted to under, underscore the importance of that comment. Heather, does that, uh, should that be amplified? Thoughts? Uh, sure, yeah. So anything that you think might be sustained should be modeled in a longer term way rather than just here's the cost of what it was to implement this. Um, no, it has longer term impacts on um, individuals who are affected, on health systems, public health departments, on society. And if we're going to be responsible about potential impacts, then we should be modeling it with the caveat that we need a lot of very good sensitivity analyses around that because there is uncertainty about um, sustaining the effect about um, modifications, adaptations, and whatnot that may happen downstream. But um, yeah, if you get people to quit smoking and hold that gain, it does have longer term impact. We want to know the full potential effect of anything we're doing in the healthcare system. Sure. Uh, so just be, uh, to, to uh, continue to encourage people for adding questions, I, I see that we have a, a couple that have been thrown in, so I'm going to go with that, the first one that popped up. Uh, so, so I think each of you talked about the importance of collecting cost data, and there's a question uh, if, if either of you or both might talk a little bit more about any educational resources that could inform folks uh, about, you know, how to uh, either how or what kind of cost data uh, that would be helpful to collect? Sure. So I, um, I think uh, two big uh, papers in the field generally, not specific to implementation science, but generally, are um, Jillian Saunders' JAMA article that summarizes the uh, second panel on cost effectiveness in health and medicine for the United States. Uh, and um, the book that she and Peter Newman put together that is the extensive and exhaustive recommendations and guidelines from that panel. Um, those are great resources. Uh, and I, one paper I love is Deb Ritzwaller's paper on costing out behavioral, interven uh, yeah, behavioral interventions because a lot of implementation science, at least that I've been involved with, is uh, very focused on behavior change and, and getting um, people, you know, like I said, to quit tobacco, to lose weight, to all these behavioral things. So those are some very um, uh, 
introductory papers. I will say, actually, the Newman book is not introductory, but the JAMA paper is a nice outline for cost to collect. Um, to actually um, get training, I don't know that TDIRC includes a cost assessment component to their class. That's something we could talk about. Um, I know here at NYU, our Comparative Effectiveness Research Training Program has an implementation science um, uh, 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 intensive program, week-long program, and we include cost assessment in that. Um, those are some first things to go to about uh, which, which data to collect and where to start. Great. Ramesh, any Three, thoughts? Yeah. Yes, so three things come to mind. I think first, um, a general good economic evaluation book. And I think I have Peter Drummond's book on my bookshelf, and, and you know, and, and there are several other really good ones that really sort of teach you, um, teach a researcher how you go about collecting and what it is that you sort of collect. Um, second, perhaps more specific, there are a range of these, um, for want of a better word, toolkits. Uh, which I actually am a big fan of because I think it gives people that are not that are not sort of skilled in this activities set of activities um, a, 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 an approach that they can then use and then modify. Uh, the best one, certainly the the longest toolkit I think, costing toolkit has probably been the World Health Organization's choice, the choosing interventions that are cost effective toolkit. In in our own field of implementation research as well. You know, Lisa Saldana has the coins approach. Um, uh, Harriet Ward at Loughborough has her costing methodology for evaluating child welfare services. So I think there are a range of these uh, collectively that I'm calling toolkits that are good resources for people that want to see how this is done in practice once they have a sense of what the theory is from an economic evaluation textbook. And I think finally, I know I can't, I think, I can't emphasize enough the importance of collaboration because costing an implementation strategy involves an, a, a very intimate relationship, intellectual intimate relationship between the economic evaluator and the actual implementation scientist, especially if you're using an activity-based costing approach because you have to have these multiple conversations about exactly what, that, what somebody is actually doing and then trying to figure out how do you attach costs to those activities so that collaboration is extraordinarily valuable on both sides. So I think that's the third thing that I would like to emphasize. And as a quick note for folks who are looking for a lot of these resources that are being mentioned, um, you want to go ahead and check out the chat. So for many of you, that's going to be the speech bubble icon located in the bottom center of your screen. Go ahead and click on that to indicate it. It should turn blue. And then most, if at all, I think I missed one, Ramesh, this is quite the test, um, of the books, articles, toolkits mentioned are, can be found there. Right. Yeah. And so, again, as, as said from the, from the outset, the goal has been to try to make sure that as uh, our speakers mention different resources, that if we can populate the chat window with those as, as chats to everybody, then, then we're trying to do that as, as efficiently uh, as we can, uh, which Sarah is doing expertly. Um, so gr great uh, to, to already be able to respond to uh, to, to folks' questions. I, I want to ask a, a broader question, and, and then I think there are actually a couple as I'm just chatting or, or looking through what people have, have written to this point uh, that might that might need to be um, follow-on questions. But uh, more broadly, uh, and maybe we can start with. Uh, Heather, and then and then move on to Ramesh. If if you're thinking about moving forward, what do you see each of you as key next steps for research that that bridges uh, implementation science and health economics? Uh, this is your chance to talk to a, a pretty sizable group that I think is is interested in what guidance or what uh, directions uh, you might uh, suggest for them to go in. Uh, so Heather, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so. What I think needs to happen is to have some kind of agreement about what costs matter and what should be incorporated in a cost analysis. I'm thinking, totally ironic, but there's a fire alarm going off during our fireside chat, so if I have to leave, I will. Um, so um, we, I, what I was saying is um, we need some guidance about what costs should be incorporated in, into analyses very, very explicitly, but 
transparency, I think, is what has been missing. You might see a cost analysis and says it costs this to, you know, get people to do that um, in this particular intervention. And there, there often is not a justification why certain costs are included or excluded, what the costs represent, what perspective somebody is taking. Is this the payer perspective? Is it the healthcare sector perspective, the societal perspective? There's a lot of missing information, and so it would never be something that could be replicated um, or even comparable. So one of the terrific things about our traditional cost-effectiveness analysis in health and medicine and the guidelines we have is our outcome is always dollars per quality gained or quality adjusted life year gained. And what's great about that is you can compare that uh, what we that's the incremental cost effectiveness ratio across any type of intervention. It doesn't matter if you're trying to reduce the number of heart attacks in a population, identify more tumors in a population, get people you know to uh, take their diabetes medications. Whatever the intervention, we always have that same comparable outcome. Um, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio of dollars per quality gained by using a new intervention versus, say, usual care. So that has been a standard in the in the more traditional field. But as we apply what we know in health economics to implementation science, there are a lot of times we can't. It doesn't make sense to use that outcome, um, and so we need to think about. Well, across all tobacco cessation uh, interventions, maybe dollars per quit would be satisfactory, for example. So at least you're coming up with some guidance and standards for the short-term cost-effectiveness analysis, what I would call it, if you can't model fully to dollars per quality gained or cost per quality gained. Um, and um, so I, I see these issues around um, having comparable outcomes so we can say what interventions are worth it as one main issue. And I see another issue around um, transparency and justification for all of the costs we may or may not be including in our analyses. Those are two highlights for me. And I fully, I think, agree um, with, um, with Heather's uh, point about what it is that we're actually measuring in terms of outcome when we're evaluating it. And, and I think, you know, qualities make a lot of sense when we are focused on clinical outcomes. Um, and some of the work that, that I do now, people are more focused on implementation outcomes. And so I'm using uh, Enola's, uh, Enola Proctor's um, um, uh, model here when I, when, I, when I refer to implementation outcomes. So, you know, if, so I think it is perfectly legitimate for us to ask, um, does a particular implementation strategy at a particular cost increase fidelity scores? Does something enhance therapist uh, competence? Um, to give you two examples of implementation outcomes that we are currently studying uh, in the Denise Wilfleet NIMH funded uh, trial right now. So there I think we, in implementation research, we are forced to use uh, outcomes, as, as, as Heather is saying, that are perhaps a trifle uh, unconventional. And I think that's fine. Um, and at, at some point, we will actually get to these ultimate patient outcomes, client outcomes. Um, and, and these are perhaps intermediate steps where we establish the efficacy of implementation strategies on achieving implementation outcomes before we uh, make that next step and talk about achievement of client outcomes. Um, I also think that um, the business case for implementation research is, is really absolutely critical. Um, you know, who should pay for implementation? Um, how can we make a convincing case to payers to pay for it? Um, there is a, there's a paper where people are talking about core competencies for implementation specialists, and, and that's terrific. How do these implementation specialists earn their keep? And what, what is the incentive for a payer organization or a provider organization or an agency to actually pay for these implementation specialists. And I think making a strong business case for implementation is the other thing that I see as important for the field. Can I just tag on to that? Sure. I think I think that you make a really interesting point about these more intermediate 
steps and intermediate outcomes. And um, when I mentioned cost per quit, uh, when someone quits smoking, um, another um, issue is around that unit of analysis that um, even if it's not so much, an in, well, I guess it would be an implementation outcome, but I'm thinking of a project I've been working on where the, um, the unit of analysis is a primary care practice, and we're trying to get them to adhere to clinical guidelines. And so our outcome has been cost per practice, which is nothing you can really do to model that out unless you have the health outcomes also. We are capturing other health outcomes like blood pressure in control in that population, um, but, but uh, firstly, we're looking at cost per practice. Does practice facilitation as a method of implementing clinical guidelines get these physicians using those and, and um, improving their patient's health downstream? Great. Um, so just want to pull a, another question that's a little bit more specific and it asks, uh, you know, I'll read it as, it, as it's written. Uh, can you elaborate on the broader areas of study other than those in traditional cost-effectiveness models, especially those areas related to patient-reported outcomes? So an interest in PROs, and, and are there, uh, I guess, are, are there suggestions of directions in, in, in terms of uh, health economics and implementation that you might uh, send uh, the, the, the questioner in response? Any thoughts on that? I actually do a lot of work in patient-reported outcomes implementation within the electronic health record. Mm -hmm. um, I have not thought about costing it out. I know it's incredibly expensive, um, and, and we're using um, our institutional funds to implement patient-reported outcomes into the EHR. Um, I guess I don't know that I, I'm not sure I fully... It, it, is, is the questioner asking about whether PROs could be the outcome, um, or is um, it implementation of PROs? So yeah, no, it's a very good question, and, and we'd certainly invite the questioner to to uh, write a follow up if if we're misinterpreting things. I saw it as beyond just focusing on a tr on traditional cost effectiveness of implementing PROs. Are there other strategies? or other analyses that you might think would be particularly relevant given this area? That's, that's my interpretation of it, but uh, again, the, the questioner yeah. can, can write in a follow-up. And you know, while we're waiting um, for that follow-up, it, it sounds like there is conceptually, right, there doesn't seem to be that much of a problem in, let's say, looking at um, self-reported satisfaction, for example, satisfaction with care as an outcome, um, especially if we're trying to implement something um, that we think is going to enhance someone's care. So conceptually, I think it 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 can be it can be done. Uh, though I confess, I have actually not worked on any patient-reported outcome directly. Well, I could think of um, you know costing out um, some kind of intervention that's supposed to reduce pain or improve physical function, and pain and physical function scores can be you know, obtain directly from the patient using something like NIH Promise um, uh, questionnaires. And you could look at, you know, a group of people you know have high pain scores and you say, we're putting in this intervention and we want to know if it improves their pain. Um, and it's a little bit tricky figuring out what's a meaningful change in pain, right? The the minimally clinically important difference, let's say. Um, there's debate about how you uh, quantify that, but it, you could quantify that uh, and use it as your outcome for some kind of pain management intervention, let's say, if I'm interpreting the, correctly, the question correct, yeah, correctly. Sure, and, and of course, you know, we, we may have uh, additional information, but wh why don't we move on to uh, um, another question? Uh, so, um, what, are the, what are some of the most effective ways to integrate implementation science and health economics with monitoring and evaluation of program interventions and the identification of opportunities for quality improvement? Any thoughts on that one? Um, 
You know, I think a lot of um, uh, the, the traditional people that have actually done implementation research, especially in manufacturing organizations, are the quality improvement people. Um, so I think historically, the entire QI um, framework and, and that, that tradition is, I think, very, very aligned with implementation research. Um, the very first um, implementation study that my colleagues and I did in, in St. Louis, um, the, our local partner at a residential care center was their head of quality improvement. And that is how we managed to sell our study to the individuals, that, that to the executive directors and leadership staff of the organization, that this was fundamentally a quality improvement project. Um, what is, I think, needed now is an upskilling of these QI professionals um, and making or helping them if they're in, so interested in becoming uh, implementation extenders. And if, if we can build those gaps, that may be a way for, for sustainment of this implementation enterprise because organizations will always have uh, a quality division that's, that's mandated that reports on various things. And for them to engage in implementation activities seems to me to be a much easier thing to do than to expect frontline provider organizations to invest money in hiring someone who's a specialist in implementation. And it sounds like just to just uh, if I can see a, a bit of uh, the question that 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 I might uh, add to, um, there is this notion of if you have ongoing monitoring and evaluation of the different interventions, um, then you might be not only focusing on quality improvement around the intervention, right, the idea that the intervention might be uh, sustained over time, delivered um, continuously, but the idea that it might be tweaked and it might change over time and there might be economic aspects to those changes that are needed. So maybe there's an addition, um, you know, Ramesh, to what you were saying just about the natural uh, connection between quality improvement and implementation, that there's an ability to look at how, what impact that has on the way in which the intervention may be changing over time, and then that kind of monitoring capacity can serve to also focus on improving the quality of the intervention rather than just the quality with which that intervention is consistently implemented over time. I don't know if that would, makes sense. Absolutely. absolutely. And yeah. I was, oh, I was thinking that exactly with learning health systems, how it's an iterative process to keep improving quality and keep improving outcomes. And there are ways to capture those costs of monitoring, of, of adapting the intervention, the changes over time. Uh, and so it seems like a very natural fit. And, you know, I think we really need much more practice-based evidence in the implementation science arena. And I think working with existing QI folks in agencies where we are attempting to implement um, our, um, our, our interventions is a very nice way of, of seamlessly securing the sort of practice-based evidence and, and local intelligence that we need for successful and sustainable implementation efforts. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so there's a, another question that I see here, which I think, in, in a sense, has been uh, woven into a number of the responses, but I'll, I'll add it in just in case there's anything that you might want to uh, respond more directly to. And it basically says, since outcomes are going to be dependent on implementation fidelity and uptake, uh, perhaps sh uh, costs should be reported uh, across a range based on these uh, implementation outcomes. Any thoughts on that one? Costs should be captured across a range? You yeah. mean uh, like fidelity costs or uptake costs? I guess I'm not quite understanding. So what, yeah, so what I'm wondering is if you assume that fidelity may vary across different sites and that level of uptake may vary across different sites. What I'm, what I'm expecting, and again, the person who originally wrote this in uh, could, could, uh, could respond if I'm totally missing this. But do you, need, uh, do you need costs that are based more on a range? So at different levels of fidelity, these are the costs that seem to be captured. At different levels of uptake, these are the costs that seem to be captured. Yeah, absolutely. yeah because um, with the issue with uptake has to do with capacity. So if you have, uh, you need to hire one staff person for a particular activity and they're not working at full capacity, their cost per 
um, person, let's say, per patient or client, um, is much higher if they're working at less than full capacity. Um, this is a really big issue in staffing. Um, if you're measuring fidelity and effectiveness based on fidelity, then yes, you could um, you know there are differences in effectiveness. There may be components of the implementation that somebody is dropping, and so there's no cost associated with it, but perhaps then through the fidelity, the effectiveness um, changes you know based on fidelity changes, then you have a lower effectiveness potentially along with that lower cost. Um, that may make um, sense in some resource limited settings especially. Uh, those are two things that I could think of related to that question. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, um, there is going to be heterogeneity in costs and there is going to be heterogeneity in outcomes whenever one is involved in a multi-site trial. Uh, we, I'm involved in a multi-site trial right now where there are significant differences in costs across these sites. Um, some are a high-cost site, some are a low-cost site for a variety of reasons, and where fidelity measures um, achievements also vary. So I think the question, the more interesting question here is why do these differences occur? Um, and, and, and this is where I think those sorts of follow-up, more mixed methods, um, sort of the second phase work actually begins by saying, you know, why is it that at some place we, we our, our implementation costs were relatively low, but fidelity measures were like through the roof? Um, what is the secret sauce that you guys are cooking? And can we figure out what that is? So I think it's a very important question. And, and, and what we need to do, I think, is to develop those sorts of methodologies and strategies that allow us to ask the why and how questions uh, instead of just the sort of what questions. I'd like to back up one quick second and, and just say something for folks who are um, on, on the call and newer to this. I always think about implementation costs and intervention costs as what would it take for me to pick up this thing I'm doing here and move it to another place. When we're measuring those costs in the central site where our intervention is taking place and everything is more controlled, um, it's, it's pretty simple. And costs vary by wages, by so many things going on um, that it's absolutely necessary to have ranges of costs that it's going to be really hard to say, oh, it costs this much here, it's definitely going to cost this much over there in that other location. So we always do need to think about um, how, the, how and why the costs will vary by location and, and put ranges on those. Great. Thanks. So I want to just uh, hit to uh, keeping in mind that and, and then seeing, thank you again for all the questions that are coming in, uh, seeing that there are various questions that I think are pointing to, um, you know, some of the either facilitators or barriers that might be seen for investigators who are, who are interested in incorporating health economics into implementation studies and, you know, either resources or what kind of expertise they, they, they might need or what may stand in their way. I wonder if each of you could quickly, and, and maybe, you know, it's again the sort of two part, there are certain facilitators that might uh, make it easier for people who are interested. There also may be known barriers that they need to overcome. Maybe we can pull together for each of you a, a quick, you know, what, what highlights you have in terms of, you know, key facilitators that you think might be helpful, but also a, a few barriers that people should be, should, should take note of. Uh, so maybe Ramesh, if, if you might take on those sort of two questions, A and B together, and then, uh, and then Heather? Certainly. So if we think about, so we can sort of group these as facilitators and barriers occurring within various domains, right? So for some individuals, it might be substantive knowledge. For others, it might be organizational buying, so on and so forth. So I'll give you an example from, from my studies, which largely involve working with uh, so-called third sector organizations in, in, delivering, in delivering care. So here, I think the key, the key facilitator is really getting leadership buy-in into this whole process. 
um, when when there is leadership transition um, or when the executive director of the agency does not sort of perceive the value in what it is that you're trying to do or we have not managed as investigators to convey to them how this actually affects your bottom line, then when support there becomes lukewarm, we found that we aren't very successful. Um, the QI folks sort of find excuses for not participating in meetings, um, reports that we wanted to uh, get uh, don't appear. So there are those sorts of, I think, um, barriers that, that are set up um, absent and, and organizational, um, organizational buy-in. Um, for the same reason, I think the, 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 the greatest facilitation, I think, that, that we can really do uh, is, as I, I think I said before, um, making the business case for why these organizations should be partnering with us. Um, and I won't belabor that point once again. Uh, and I, I would say um, one of um, the best facilitators is going to be finding, if you're not a, a cost-effectiveness analysis expert, is to to find somebody you can work with and talk through the issues, um, getting that kind of support is going to make it easier. I'm a trained methodologist, so I'm, I'm uh, as a health services researcher, so that that's my bent is um, getting getting that help if you need the help. Um, I think um, a couple barriers I can think of. One is somebody promises you the data and then they can't get it or they can't they don't come through and you have to start waving your hands a lot trying to figure out oh my gosh what did this cost and how many hospitalizations did we actually prevent we can't follow these patients over time and um, I've had that happen it's super frustrating where you think you've upfront worked you know as intellectual equals making sure they they know exactly the data you want and then a big barrier is well doesn't actually come through and you need to be more creative and figure out ways to get the um, utilization data cost data etc uh, so so that can be frustrating I think also um, the fact that there hasn't been explicit agreement on the cost to collect and how to collect those data uh, you know, do you use salary information? Do you use hours worked for an hourly wage? There are all kinds of um, questions about feasibility. So you don't want to spend so much energy and time obtaining cost data, and it's a really going to have a really small impact on your analysis, uh, that it's not worth it. But you also want to do a legitimate analysis with high quality cost data. So there's a tension between uh, how rigorously you uh, capture data and uh, analyze it uh, and uh, what's realistic given everybody's time constraints. Um, so those are a few things I would say to that. Great. Let me ask, uh, there, oh, sorry, Ramesh, did you want to quickly oh. jump in with them? Yes, I and mean, whenever I hear Heather speak, I'm like, yes, yes, that is so cool. So, you know, I think it's it's also important, I think, for um, especially for new entrants who are interested in economic evaluations in implementation research to recognize that this is still in many ways an imperfect science. And I think the subtext of uh, Heather's comments is that, you know, there is, there is fuzz here. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the questioner who raised the issue of, of ranges. Um, so I think, you know, find good collaborators, do the best science you can. And I think once the, once the time comes to publish these papers, I think if one is honest and says, hey, you know, this is the best that we could do, all of us who do this work are fully sympathetic of the challenges. And so I think you will receive an informed review when it comes to publication. Great, thanks. Um, just uh, wanna want to note that we have about 14 minutes left uh, before folks likely have other things to jump onto. Um, so we're gonna try and get a little bit more rapid in, in our uh, both questioning and our responses to see how many of the uh, questions that are that are coming in um, we we can uh, we can entertain and, and at least try and uh, try and address. Uh, so one quick one that I hear comes up a lot, and that's uh, the question of when you need a sort of card-carrying health economist expert, uh, 
um, and need that person to really be leading the, uh, the, the particular uh, study that you want to do versus where there are resources that can enable somebody who might be more in the implementation science space but not as much of a health economist. Um, and and so, so is there any advice for people as to how do you determine what kind, what level of expertise you need on your team, or is, or does it come down to the it depends kind of answer? <laughs> I'd say it depends. You know, how savvy are you? How quickly can you learn? If you are an implementation scientist, you're already really smart, and so it just takes some time to read through some of these papers on how to do this, and uh, you. You know, maybe you need an accountant who can kind of, or someone with more of a bean counting mind um, to help you with, uh, especially if it's a simpler kind of implementation uh, rather than a, a health economist. I, if I can push people away and say, no, just go get a bean counter, I do. Um, uh, doesn't always require a full blown economic analysis. I agree. I think review committees can be conservative. But I think um, if you're doing a project out in the real world, um, the, the idea of picking an accountant is actually excellent advice. Uh, much of my work comes from the theoretical traditions of accounting, and I think it's a very conceptually powerful um, way to, to do costing. If you have access to top-notch health economists, by all means, collaborate with them. But that should not limit someone doing economic evaluations in this field. Great. Uh, you, so you'll still notice, hopefully, if you're keeping up on the chat um, box, that there's a fair number of different resources, one of them related uh, to a question that I'm just about to ask. I think each of you have mentioned the importance of mixed methods, and there is a specific uh, article uh, that was just released, which, is, uh, which Sarah has provided to folks. Um, but I wonder if uh, either of you might want to just comment briefly on any ideas for mixed methods cost studies in implementation science, uh, as it was asked by somebody. Um, I like to think of um, explanatory uh, mixed methods uh, studies because um, I felt that that's, the, that's where I have the most need. So after you sort of conduct this particular, uh, particular evaluation, you arrive at some costs and you're looking at data and you're, then you're really sort of not quite sure why exactly this is happening the way that the data says that they are happening. I think that's where it's, it's sometimes often very nice to have um, an, an exploratory, sorry, an explanatory next step where, um, where you can have a methodologist uh, assist you in, in uncovering some of those systems and processes that help you better understand um, your data. Of course, the other corollary is absolutely valid as well. And most of us, I guess, um, unconsciously do a lot of explanatory sort of, um, exploratory sort of work at the front end. I, I, th I tend to think of mixed methods as really being integral to the practice of cost evaluations, economic evaluations, and I'm just glad that there is increasing attention being paid to this important methodological tool. Yeah, absolutely. I think qualitative methods are, are relevant in economic analysis. If you find something, uh, you know, it's just so expensive and you can't quite figure out why, talking to the folks on the ground in the implementations on the scene um, can be really useful. Oh, you know what? These folks are spending all this time on travel, you know, getting across town. I'm in New York. It's relevant. Um, and so they're not getting that much time doing the actual program they're supposed to be doing. Oh, well, do we need to rethink and redefine how we cost out their time then? Because other places may not have such extensive travel time. It just so happens in this particular environment, that's what's going on. Um, and so I, I absolutely think um, getting that perspective, that qualitative perspective and insight is really important to thinking about this. Great. Uh, another question that came up is that typically, and, and again from some of our papers about, uh, various papers about implementation outcomes, cost is very much central, uh, centrally listed as an outcome. But uh, the questioner asks, uh, if you're thinking about other implementation outcomes, would you also consider cost to be a predictor of those other outcomes? So how you deal with it, I guess, is both uh, outcome and uh, potential determinant. Uh, there I see it as maybe um, in the adaptation. Uh, so I'm not an implementation scientist. Let me just be really uh, 
uh, upfront about that. Um, but in adaptation, we may think about in the initial implementation, it was just way too cost prohibitive. And so we need to do some adaptation to reduce the cost so that we can actually sustain this program going forward. That's where I can see how costs are um, important to assess in one phase and may then change what you do going forward. I tend to think of costs as intermediate outcomes. So we absolutely want to do something that is um, that reduces cost, but that you know can't be the sole prerogative, right? That's not the so only reason why one does a particular study. One actually wants to see enhancements you know, in some sort of a in, in some sort of a more distal outcome. So I think the the answer, in my mind at least, is it's actually a bit of both. I think the way I think about this. Great, thanks. Um, so again, noting we have about uh, seven minutes or so left, um, just want to move to another one. Um, how do you view the cost of technology to support new interventions? Is it part of the cost of the intervention, or is it something that an organization has to have prior to implementation of a new intervention? So I, yeah, I think this is a part of a sort of broader theme, which is the degree to which you would consider certain costs as um, endogenous, I guess, to the implementation effort and what things would you see as, as exogenous or part of a broader context? And any thoughts there or is it also an it depends? I would no, say in, in it, my, it, oh, go ahead, Ramesh. So in my, uh, in some of the writings that we've done and, and some of the work that, um, that we've pushed out, we've tended to view the costs of developing a particular intervention as exogenous to implementation costs because it, it, I think if, if suppose we, um, if suppose we group that here, then I think it, it enhances the cost equation to such an extent that it becomes very, very difficult to actually demonstrate any outcome. This would be analogous to saying that the cost of drug development should be a part of any cost effectiveness study when we're looking at pharmacotherapeutic interventions, because if it costs a billion dollars to develop a drug, that's going to wipe out any possible um, outcomes um, at all, cost effectiveness outcomes at all. So, so yes, so I think we have to figure out what that separation is and we have to be comfortable with that separation. The problem I think arises in many of these sort of type two um, designs where you're actually fielding both a, a, a trial of efficacy as well as a trial of effectiveness simultaneously. And there it becomes really hard to parse these out. And I think that's where certainly I have a lot of problems and I don't think I have perfect solutions there. I think a lot of times the intervention would not be considered, uh, the development of the intervention, is that's, that's done before the implementation, and so we wouldn't include it in the cost effectiveness analysis. Potentially adaptation costs we would. But as I think, um, uh, how I heard this question about the cost of technology, if this is something you want to implement, for example, in the electronic health record and you don't have an electronic health record, well, the decision maker is going to have to buy that electronic health record in order to uh, have this intervention as part of their um, programs. Um, so in, in that case, um, the the technology would need to be uh, in play in the cost analysis or you can't do the intervention, right? It's different than picking up something off the shelf that's already been proven effective and you run with it versus, oh, you have to have this infrastructure in order to do this. Well, then you have to pay for the infrastructure and it actually matters for how cost effective it might be. Yeah, and, and I might think it's the Sorry, I, I think it speaks to a, a broader challenge that we've had throughout, which is trying to understand the bounds of a particular intervention and where does the intervention end and the implementation strategy begin. And so we've had different programs that in some cases have, continue, have, have contained certain components that are really the, uh, the intervention that's trying to improve health and other components that are really focusing around trying to improve the implementation of those components. And so it sounds like in similar case, the technology might be readily available and it's about just trying to incorporate it or it may require, I think, Heather, as you're saying, an upfront investment to make sure that it could actually be part of the intervention delivery process. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Good. Good summary. Cool. 
Um, okay, so one last question uh, that I have, which is related around this technology, and that's, um, and again, thanks a lot for all the questions and apologies if, if we uh, didn't uh, get to all of them, uh, but it asks around decision aids. So how, how do we study the cost of implementing and practice in intervention such as a decision aid that may be freely available on the web? I see that as um, you may need to, tr well, if it's only sending the patient to the decision aid, you have the cost of sending the patient to the decision aid, whether that's a mailing or uh, an, an email or something. If you're walking through it, the decision aid with a patient, then you have the time of the worker, you know, the staff person who's walking through it with the patient. I guess it depends how you implement the decision aid. Yes, it's freely available, so you're not paying for the aid itself, but you're paying for time uh, and not not development. Um, and how you get the, yeah, go ahead. You know, you know I was just, this reminds me. I was having a conversation with someone who was extolling the virtues of bibliotherapy from an economic perspective, and the argument was that well, all you need is the cost of a 14.95 uh, paperback from Amazon, and the cost of the opportunity cost of the of the consumer who's actually reading that book, and that really is the entire amount of money that anybody is investing on the intervention from, of course, from the patient perspective, um, and and maybe that's all there is to it. So I think it depends upon what that decision aid actually is, what the nature of yeah. that quote unquote intervention is. And I think once you, you once the questioner relates that and helps the implementation economist understand what that is, I think collaboratively you can come up with a model that works for both of you. That's right. Is it changing behavior and therefore changing health or healthcare utilization or other downstream outcomes? Uh, definitely those need to be captured. Mm -hmm. And I think it also speaks to, and this was another comment that was made, that depending on the setting, we may have a whole range of other costs that we need to account for uh, that might not have been assumed in the original trial when the intervention was tested, but may certainly affect uh, whether a particular intervention can be implemented. So with that, um, we want to, of course, thank our two wonderful experts for spending their time and sharing their wisdom with us. Uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Sarah, who can thank you all and, and, uh, and, and send us off into the sunset. The, the dark night. Thanks so much, David. So I do again want to thank Ramesh, Heather, and David for their time and to all of you for these really detailed questions. Um, we, I'm going to do my best to aggregate all the resources mentioned, and I will be tweeting that out. You can, it's a plug for us. So if you want to find that on Twitter, it'll be at NCI Implicy. You can also find that on our website. Our Twitter is at the bottom of our page. Um, so if you're looking for that, that is the place I'll be able to host that information. And so to wrap this up very quickly, your feedback is important to us, and we encourage you to complete our online evaluation. A link to a survey will open in a new window once this session is concluded. An archive of today's session will be made available shortly on our website. Thank you again for joining us. We, look, we are looking forward to another year of engaging webinars. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye.